tonight on Nova. Cliff Stoll, New Age Detective. What's up, Cliff? Hacker again. He's in an army base. What you gonna do? Call the army. A lone scientist on the trail of a computer spy. The hacker is out there somewhere, raiding computers, stealing government files. Hi, is Manning? Some computer hacker's looking for him. The true story of Cliff Stoll's real-life adventure featuring the actual participants recreating the events is the KGB, the computer, and me. I don't get it. Funding for NOVA is provided by the Johnson & Johnson family of companies, supplying health care products worldwide. And Lockheed, a bold new force in systems engineering, management, and technology services for defense, space, and industry. Major funding for NOVA is provided by the financial support of viewers like you. I'm an astronomer, a scientist who uses computers every day. I'm not a spy catcher or some kind of CIA agent. But somehow I found myself living inside a spy story. It had everything. A shadowy villain stealing government files and selling them to the KGB. An intrepid detective, obsessed with his case, hunting everywhere for clues. The hero's sweetheart, his helpful colleagues, even the CIA. It led me into a maze of computers and electronic communication networks and ended in a foreign country far away. I was chasing a new kind of criminal, a hacker, sneaking into military computers, stealing secrets. As a scientist, it was bewildering. But in the end, it was science that showed the way out. Let me tell you what happened. It all started innocently enough, the first day in a new job. I was an astronomer whose grant had run out. Luckily, the lab hired me to run their computers. Dave Cleveland showed me around. He was a real wizard, someone who knew everything about the lab's dozen or so giant computers. This is the graphics Physicists and astronomers used these computers for, well, physics and astronomy. My job was to make sure everything worked smoothly. It was about as far away from spies and espionage as you could get. They gave me a choice of two offices, a booth with a view of the Golden Gate Bridge or a small unventilated cubicle. I chose the cubicle. I had barely moved in when... Well, this is the monthly accounting report and there's a discrepancy. First time we've ever had a discrepancy in the monthly accounting. Really? Really? What we have to money or is it? Yeah, time money. Or? We have to charge for all the Dave said that there were hundreds of people who used the lab's computers. We they were charged three hundred bucks an hour, so the bills added up to thousands of dollars. Now, for the first time ever, his monthly accounts didn't balance. Well, at the end of that particular month, we had seventy five cents left over in charges that we had no one to bill for. And that was very frustrating because our programs, our accounting programs were very accurate and uh, we knew it, it wasn't a uh, rounding problem or something like that, or arithmetic error. We knew we, we didn't have someone to charge the 75 cents to. And what happened to that person? Where'd they come from? Where'd they go? And uh, it opened up a whole can of worms. Uh, Thousands of dollars in charges off by 75 cents. Didn't sound like much, but it was an interesting problem. A big error would mean an obvious bug in the system. Easy to find, easy to fix. 
But 75 cents? That's a challenge. The accounting system looked like a labyrinth, but I wrote some test programs and, amazingly, it all worked perfectly. So where was the 75 cent error coming from? I was looking at the list of authorized users when one name caught my eye. Hunter. This guy didn't have an account number. He must have used 75 cents of computer time and not paid for it. Well, I didn't know who this hunter was, so I shut him down. That was the end of it, or so I thought. The next day, a new problem appeared. A computer in Maryland, named DocMaster, sent us a message. Somebody in our lab had tried to break into their computer. Dave was supposed to find out who it was. He knew just what to do. used to be that computers were isolated. Big computer here would solve one problem, this computer would solve another. Now, though, we share data from one scientist to another, and that means we need to network our computers. We need to send messages from one system to another, yet to another. Those computer networks form communities, form neighborhoods where one system sends information to another, and it's not just the computers that form the communities, the people using them are in one large neighborhood as well. Our networks are like a new kind of highway system. Once you get on a network, you can travel around the world. All you have to do is find a computer's network address and then call it up. You type in your account name and then your password. The password's usually not displayed to keep it secure from somebody looking over your shoulder. If you're legitimate, it invites you in. You can even dial up a network on a telephone line with your home computer. It all works great until somebody, a hacker, tries to break in where he doesn't belong. <laughs> By lunchtime the next day, I'd found Dave's villain. Only one person was connected from our lab to DocMaster at the time of the attempted break-in. Dave was impressed until I told him who it was. Someone named Spentech. Spentech? Oh, that's impossible. Joe is the professor down at the university here, a well-known computer scientist. He's worked here for years. A, a lot of us know him. He's not the type of guy to break into a computer. Besides, he's so good, we probably wouldn't have caught him if he had decided to break in. So much for being a computer whiz. Spentech wasn't even in the country, Dave said. Some local student must have stolen his account and used it while he was away. I wanted to teach this guy a lesson. Next day, I set a trap. My plan was simple. I'd get the hacker on the line and then trace him. Somehow. I programmed my terminal to beep whenever anyone logged into the lab. You'd be surprised how many people logged in. I was. This was some program. I wasn't catching any hackers, and I wasn't getting any work done either. At 12.33, my terminal beeped for the hundredth time. Spentech was back. A minute later, he logged off. All he'd left was a terminal number. 
the line that he'd used to enter the lab's computer system. A clue. It was time to see Paul Murray. Okay, Lloyd, we're gonna follow two cables on Unix 1. There they are. Yeah, that's one of them. Yeah. Got the other one. There were miles of cables snaking through the lab, yeah. and Paul, okay. along right. with Lloyd Belknap, knew every foot. Okay. I got it. They quickly confirmed that the hacker was coming in from outside okay. the lab. That was the good news. The bad right. news was that the lab had 50 phone lines. The hacker might have okay. come in on any of them. Paul knew how to find this guy. Attach a printer to each line and print out every call that came in. Great. Except, where am I going to find 50 printers? Once again. It took a whole evening to liberate 50 printers from around the lab. Now I was ready. All I needed was the hacker to try to sneak in. I woke up that morning to find 80 feet of printout next to my computer. This hacker hadn't just broken in, he'd become super user. Super user. He was like an apartment manager who had a pass key to get him into any apartment in the whole building. He not only could read any file in my whole system, but he could change any of them. He could erase any of those files. And he got in through a security hole. On our computer, you can send mail to someone else in the computer. All you have to do is rename a file. That file then belongs to whoever you addressed it to. It moves into the new owner's account. It turned out that you could even send mail into the systems area, which runs the whole machine. We didn't know that, but the hacker did. He wrote a computer program saying, Make me the boss, super user. Then he addressed his program to the systems area, and in it went. Now his program had to be run. Here was the clever part. The systems area has a program which is automatically turned on every five minutes to take care of routine chores. The hacker designed his program to temporarily replace the real program. He mailed his letter and waited. Five minutes after his phony program was installed, the computer ran it and made this hacker systems manager, super user. He now controlled the entire Lawrence Berkeley lab system. This guy was no fool. Once he became super user, he'd cover his tracks. He'd change the accounting system so that any record of his being there was covered up. It's a little bit like brushing away your footprints as you walk down a street.
If I was going to catch this guy, I'd have to be as sneaky as he was. I couldn't grab 50 printers to monitor him all the time. I needed an alarm system, a simple way to detect this phony Spentech every time he logged into the lab. The first part was an electronic dialer. It was simple and cheap. It cost me 99 bucks. How you doing today? All right. I'll one of these guys. Okay. Would that be all for you today? Yeah, that'll make me happy. The next part was complicated and expensive. I needed to identify Sventech's login among the stream of data pouring into the lab. Yeah, getting there. Lloyd Belknap came up with the answer. A logic analyzer. That looks good. And the ankle bone's connected to the neck bone. Hey. Go ahead. Lloyd fixed it to intercept the data stream right. and watch for a single word. Sventech. What's going on? Anything up? Uh, not yet. Okay. Anything there? Yeah. All right, so you're spooling something out there. Yeah, we should be getting a bunch of things. All we should right. be getting a lot of lists of files. Ah, yeah. great, look at that. It's coming over great. Nifty. When the logic analyzer spotted Sventech, it was supposed to signal a dialer, which was supposed to telephone me. Whatever comes out here is bopping out here. Yeah. Hey, Dave? Dave? Yeah? Do me a favor. Log in as Spentech. You got it. <laughs> Works great. Fine. OK. It was a good system, but it had one small flaw. When my phone rang, I had to be there to answer it. After a week or two, without a sign of Sventec, I was looking for improvements. When I wasn't sleeping under my desk, I lived a couple miles from the lab with my sweetheart Martha. She was a law student at Berkeley. It wasn't easy to explain to her why chasing some student hacker kept me at the lab night after night. She was starting to get mad, so I came up with another of my bright ideas. Say, sweetheart? Mm hmm? Um, I solved the problem of having to sleep up at the laboratory at night. Huh? With the hacker thing? Yeah, I figured out a way that I don't have to stay there at night anymore. Wonderful. Um, here. Look at this. This is a pocket pager. Yeah? Well, I fixed it up so that, here, I'll show you. Watch while I log in to Sventech over here. Mm-hmm. And just wait for a second or two. Ain't that neat? I don't get it. Whenever this hacker comes into the lab computers, this pocket pager goes off. Mm -hmm. And so I can find out when he's on any time of the day or night. Yeah, and then what do you do? I run up the lab and start checking things out. So anytime he logs on, even if it's in the middle of the night, yeah. you carry this with you and this thing goes off. Yeah. And when you hear it go off, you get out of bed or wherever you are and you go up to the lab, and you make a phone trace. Yeah, that's about how it works. Great. Now I really had to catch this guy, if only to make peace with Martha. He was out there, somewhere, walking around free, while I was tied to an electronic leash. Luckily, the beeper worked. Hello? 
When the hacker called, I was waiting. What's up, Cliff? Hacker again. He's in an army base. What you gonna do? Call the army. Same guy who logged into my computer as Sventec was logging into an army computer under the name Hunter. Same guy who caused that 75 cent accounting imbalance. Once he got into this army computer, I could see him searching their database, looking for military information, looking for stuff about their missile plans. Weird stuff was happening here. Scientists used the networks to connect to other labs and universities. But you could also connect to a network of unclassified military computers over something called the Milnet. That's what the hacker did. When he got onto the Milnet, he tried to get into one computer after another. He didn't do anything fancy. He tried standard account names and passwords. All new computers are supplied with them. You're supposed to replace them, but people forget even on military computers. I was amazed at how successful he was. On one out of every 10 or 20 computers, he'd get in. Once inside a computer, he'd set up a phony account. I began to collect the account names that he'd create. I saw him create Hunter, Hedges, Jaeger, Benson. Over and over again, they didn't mean much to me but they might mean something to our local word expert. Thirty-seven. Maggie Morley is the lab's librarian. One nineteen. One nineteen. She plays rough and tumble Scrabble to tournament standards, and she never forgets a good word. Uh, the words he was interested in were Jaeger and uh, Benson and uh, Hunter and Hedges. Well, I thought Jaeger was a nice word. I'm a Scrabble player, and um, that word Jaeger once gave me a large uh, score because I played the J in Jaeger on a triple letter score, and I played the entire word on a double word score. Um, Jaeger, I also knew, was, uh, was a kind of bird which... Uh, uh, harassed other birds, causing them to drop the food from their beaks. Um, and it's also a German word meaning hunter. So right at that moment, we correlated hunter and Jaeger as being akin. Uh, as for the Hedges and Benson, well, anybody who's ever smoked has heard of Benson and Hedges cigarettes. So we sort of leapt to the conclusion that um, the hacker was might be a smoker, and he might uh, be smoking Benson and Hedges cigarettes. Now we were getting somewhere. By this time, other people were helping out. Ron Vivir was the technical whiz of TimeNet, a computer network company. He traced the hacker from our lab to his terminal in Oakland, and then to a telephone line at Pacific Bell's exchange. Steve Doherty of Pacific Bell agreed to take up the tracing from there as soon as we got a search warrant. The Oakland district attorney got us a warrant, and we were ready to go. Yeah. 
Hello, time net. It's flipped still. We need a trace on port number 420 coming out of Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Yeah, 420. Hold on, let me get the trace. Yes, coming in on Oakland again. Port 322-2902. Yes, 430-2902. That's the one to trace, Steve. Right, hang on, I'll be right on it. Let me get Oakland online. Oakland. Oakland, Steve Doherty. Yes, we have the number on trace again, please. Hang on. Okay. That's 4E, Steve. Looks like we're heading to AT&T. Oakland 4E, hang on. I listened in as Steve added one technician after another to the trace. Okay, we got AT &T Oakland Each online. time the trail led to a different phone company, a new group of technicians joined in. They seemed to understand what was happening, Rich even Milford. if I oh, didn't. Yes. Rich, Steve Doherty, Pack Bell Security, San Francisco. How you doing? Yes, we have a trace in progress right now, and we have a trace back to your Oakland 4E. We need to continue this trace. In just a couple right minutes, now. Steve traced the call yeah, clear the across the country and, uh, to the East Coast. Okay, Steve, I got it. Looks like you're on your way to Virginia. AT&T, Arlington 4E. I have your 5096. It's leaving me to see and pay McLean. Trunk room 427. You're on the truck day to McLean, and it's almost dinner time. Suddenly, there were six people on the line. All of us waiting, trying to pull a needle out of an electronic haystack. Uh, we trace a number, but to make sure that we've uh, traced the right trunk group, we want to pull the heat coils. And we do this, we'll drop the connection here. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Tell her to go right ahead. I'll see what happens here. Place your beds. Here we go. I'll pop the fuse. Now. Yeah, that did it all right. It's 1060, all right. That's all, boys. I'll shuffle some papers and ship them on upstairs. Bye now. So, so who's the hacker? I can't tell you. I don't have the trace information. Uh, the technician in Virginia does, and um, she won't give it to us. Why not? Well, our search warrant is for California, and it's no good in Virginia. Oh, no. Great. We traced the hacker all the way to Virginia, now the phone company won't tell me who he is. When I calmed down, I looked at what the hacker had been up to. He was in a government computer again. This time, he was looking for members of the CIA. And he found them, too. Phone numbers, names, Everything. Should I call them? Well, why not? Hi, Ed Manning. Yeah, some computer hacker's looking for you. He broke into our computer, then he's going out over the millnet looking for people. Yeah. Now I was in trouble. The CIA wanted to see sure. me. Yeah, you could come out here, but... Monday? Well, look, it wasn't quite like that. But the CIA people did come out wearing suits and sunglasses. But they wouldn't help out. Domestic surveillance, counter-espionage, that stuff's, how should I say, not their bailiwick. The FBI wouldn't get involved either. They felt that, look, 75-cent error, 
It's not worth our time to check into it. So I had to rely on what I knew best, doing science. In science, you gather and analyze data and do experiments. So that's what I did. He's still here, Lloyd. Okay. He's still here. All right. Give me a second. Get this set up right. When the hacker stole data from our computer into his, he used a program called Kermit to transfer it. Kermit would send a packet of data and then wait. When the hacker's computer got the packet, it replied, got that one, send the next batch. If I could measure the delay time between each reply, then I could calculate how far away the hacker was. In practice, it was a little more complicated than that because the path might not be direct. The connection goes through a series of relay stations called nodes. They might interfere with the calculation. I didn't know. But we did the experiment anyway. One, two, three. Three seconds? One, yeah, one, two, r right about three seconds. Three seconds round trip. That's from Berkeley to wherever he is and back. Yeah, three seconds. At the speed of light, that's about 270, 280,000 miles away. For basic physics, he's someplace on the moon. Uh, sure. That's what it says. Well. How else are you going to get three seconds of delay? Well, if he's coming through several different nodes, every node that the packet gets sent through is going to add its own delay. Oh, so, so you're going to have, depending on the route, it may be different. So, so what we have to do is figure out how much delay each node add, adds to it and figure out how many, well, that'll tell us how many nodes there are between here and there, and that'll tell us about how far away he is. To sort out this problem with the nodes, with the relay stations, we figured we'd perform a little experiment. We'd connect from our Berkeley, California computers to systems across the country and measure the delay times for packets to go from our place to somebody else's computer and come back. First, we went from Berkeley down to Los Angeles and back, we found that, hey, we're getting delay times of a quarter second, third of a second. Okay. Then from Berkeley to Iowa and back, getting delays of three quarters of a, of a second. Further away from Berkeley we get, longer the delay. Then from California to Boston and back, getting delay times of a second and a half. Okay. But none of these were three seconds long. That delay was outside the bounds of our experiment. It seemed as though the more data I looked at, the more puzzles there were. Strange. Mm hmm? Weird. What? What happens around, say, 12 noon? Lunch. No, really. I've been analyzing this hacker's times, and he shows up most often around 12 noon or 1 o'clock. So? Come here and look at this. Come here. He's, he's showing up in the afternoon, you know, noon, 1 o'clock. He hardly ever shows up at night. Why would he show up when there's a lot of people around in the day? He hardly ever shows up when nobody's around, in the middle of the night. Well, maybe it's nighttime where he is. In Virginia? That business with Virginia was another false lead. The hacker just wasn't there. I finally discovered our phone trace had led to a computer belonging to a company called MITRE. The hacker had broken into MITRE from somewhere else and then dialed straight out again. It was a way of hiding his tracks. And Miter paid his phone bill. I still didn't know where the hacker was coming from. But the trace to Miter woke up the authorities. Miter is in McLean, Virginia. They do secret research for the Defense Department. They're just two miles from Langley and the headquarters of the CIA. 
Miter shut out the hacker, but he found other routes to my computer and roamed freely through the networks. In just a few months, he got into 40 military and defense computers. None of them were supposed to contain top secrets. After all, computers with classified information are isolated from the networks. But I could never be sure what the hacker would find or what he'd piece together bit by bit from different sources. One Saturday morning, the case began to crack. I got a live one. Trace my port 14. Okay, hold on. This will just take a second. Cliff, are you sure this is the same guy? Yeah, I'm sure it's him. Okay, I've got his network address locked on, but he's coming in from somewhere strange. Like where? He's uh, coming in from outside TimeNet. He's coming in on a circuit that's owned by International Telephone Telegraph Company. You mean he's, he's coming in from abroad? No doubt about it. Hello. Oh, hi, Cliff. Um, I'm calling you back on behalf of Ron Vivere. He asked me to call you because you've been receiving some calls from a hacker? Yeah, he's still here. OK, well, uh, Ron asked me to get involved because the call is coming through a gateway. and uh, I'll The hacker had stubbed his toe when he used that ITT uh, line. Steve traced it to a satellite and filled in a big piece of the puzzle. I think the address of the caller. So where is he coming from? Well, he's coming from uh, West Germany. That's the Bundespost network. Uh, we'll probably hear back from them about Monday. Yeah, OK. Thanks a lot, thank you. OK, Dave. thanks. Bye. Bye. Germany. Now the clues made sense. The times that this hacker shows up, noon, one o'clock out in Berkeley. Heck, that's nine or ten in the evening in Germany. The time when a hacker's going to be breaking into computers. And the passwords this guy's using. Stuff like Jaeger, Hunter, yeah. Maggie Morley had said just that. Jaeger is German for Hunter. And the packet time returns. It was a second and a half from Berkeley, California to Boston. All I had to do was extrapolate to realize that then it's going to be three seconds to get from Berkeley out to Germany. I'd been blind. In Germany, the Bundespost quickly traced the hacker into Hanover. There, we ran into another roadblock. The problem was at the telephone exchange. This German exchange dated back to the 50s and was filled with antique rotary switches. The technician had to test a room full of switches by hand. That could take over an hour. But the hacker never stayed on the line that long. Frustrating? You bet. Hello, Steve White speaking. Ah, oh, hi, Cliff. OK, one second, one moment. Cliff, I saw him a moment ago, but then he was gone. Oh. oh. Yeah, better luck next time. See ya. Bye. Damn. 
For weeks it went on like this. Time after time, the hacker would log on for five minutes or less and then disappear. So I got smart. I asked Martha and her housemate Claudia what to do. How long does it take to do the whole trace? Well, we can get them to Germany really fast, but mm -hmm. once we're in Hanover, phone company needs half an hour, an hour to finish the trace. Mm -hmm. How come they're so slow? Some kind of mechanical switch, or they have, some guy has to walk along and check things out, I guess. But wait, so he would have to be on the LBL computer for a total of like an hour? Yeah, we need him on for an hour. Well, there isn't anything on our machine that he'd want to read. That's right. He comes in, steps through our machine, and goes elsewhere. There's nothing in our machine that's interesting to him. He's a, I mean, look, it's just science. <laughs> Military stuff, that's another story, but my system in Berkeley? No, it's wide open. It, what? It's, Public, practically. If there isn't anything he's interested on your machine now, won't you make some up? Huh? Well, if you want him to stay on the machine, there should be something there that he wants to read. So why don't you make up some secret government information? Well, no, I secrets. mean, seriously. Yeah, but he doesn't know. I mean, if it's a secret, then he wouldn't know that we made it up. Like, took, like... Those memos you always get from the Department of Energy and change them a little bit and put, like, Star Wars in it and stuff? You mean phony secrets? Say it was like this information network, like there'd be Center for Processing Documents, and it was really, it would all be, like, really bureaucratic and boring and, you know, oh, something yeah. about, you know, implementing the implementation procedure and, and, um... So it has to sound bureaucratic and boring. Right, and most mm -hmm. of it would be nothing at all, but every once in a while we'd drop little things like SDI and... Um, Star Wars chemical stuff. warfare and, you know. <laughs> chemical warfare. Yeah, well, why not? Yeah. You can even use, like, stuff like mailing lists, you know, like form letters and mailing lists. Oh, and... you could give him an address to write to. Maybe he'll be dumb enough to write to it. To put his name on the mailing list. Hey, you know, it wouldn't take a couple afternoons to do. It would just be planting something that he'd want to nibble and enough of it so that he'd have a feast. Mm. At least for a couple hours. Be down, taken down, installed for a cell, release line, dial back up. Okay. Well, that sounds good. I have my phone. I'll call you later. Yeah. Hi, Steve White speaking. Oh, hi, Cliff. Is our friend on again? Yeah, hacker's on. Start the trace. Okay. I was already logged in. I got him. I think he's coming from Hanover again. Um, let me call the Bundespost. I'll call you right back, okay? Okay, it looks like... Yeah, it looks like he swallowed the bait. It's going to be a long session. Great. Just try to keep him on. Yep. Thanks. Bye.
Jeff, great news. The trace is complete. The Germans got him? Yep, they got all the digits of the phone number now. Well, who is he? Well, they won't tell us at the moment. They have to go get the warrants and things, but uh, they know who it is. So we did it. Far out. Well, I'm headed home to celebrate. Celebrate with a strawberry milkshake. I think I'll have a beer. Bye. Well, that was that. Case solved. Or almost. It had taken six months to trace this hacker, and it would be another six months before I found out who he was. The Germans still had to catch him, and we had to gather enough evidence to bring him to trial. Now the FBI really did help out. In charge of the case was Special Agent Mike Gibbons. Well, Cliff had originally traced the hackers into my backyard in Northern Virginia, but I didn't really have a lot to go on. Uh, a few weeks later, he called me and told me that the hackers were all the way over across the ocean in Germany and that he really needed some help. We thought it was a pretty serious matter when you have people from another country that are breaking into various government and military computer systems. So we opened a full investigation into the matter. We met with the Germans uh, over here and tried to describe what was going on. We found we had no extradition in place, no way to bring these hackers over to American justice. Uh, but the Germans had some new laws in place and were quite willing to prosecute them over there. The case finally came to trial in January 1990. It was held in Sella, a small town near Hanover. Amazingly, we'd stumbled across not just a hacker, but an actual spy ring. A bunch of people breaking into computers and selling whatever they could find to the KGB. Three years after Dave had asked me to find that 75 cent error, there I was, an expert witness in a case of international espionage. Four people were involved in the case. Dirk Brzezinski and Peter Carl. Brzezinski was a programmer. Carl, a former croupier, was a contact person for the KGB. Carl Cook, also known as Hagbard, died a few months before the trial took place. And the hacker I had followed, the face behind the printouts. Marcus Hess, 28 years old, a programmer from Hanover. When asked, Hess admitted that was a Benson and Hedges he was smoking. Another score for Maggie. All the defendants were found guilty. They were sentenced to up to two years in prison, but were released on probation. They were also fined $12,000, about a quarter of what they had received from the KGB. They hadn't stolen any state secrets, but they proved something else. With just a telephone line and a home computer, you can break into supposedly secure computers thousands of miles away. We were surprised with the relative ease that they broke into a lot of these computer systems. It was really not through flaws in the computers. It was because some of the computer systems left their front door wide open. Uh, we don't feel this is really a sudden breakdown of security. People have been breaking into institutions for a number of years and hacking, as it's called. But uh, what we're having now is that the computers are used uh, so much in the everyday way of every business and every government agency that now we have a lot of sensitive information on these computers. And now it's a much more serious matter for someone to break into one of these uh, institutions and steal the information or alter it. My journey was almost over. What had started in my lab in Berkeley was ending half a world away in the back streets of Hanover. Before I left Germany, I went to see the apartment where my hacker, Marcus Hess, had lived. Although the trial was over, I was still curious. What were these hackers like? What had gone on behind those curtains? In Hanover, the hackers had a kind of club. They'd all meet regularly at the Kaiser Pub.
A reformed member of the club agreed to meet me there and tell me what things had been like from the hacker's point of view. His name was Volker Ulla. So we only wanted to hack for freedom of information and, and showing co holes in computers. Then we all realized that this had, had happened and no one could believe. No one of us could believe that this had happened. Did you know Marcus Hess at the time? Were you yes, I, I knew him very well, but, but uh, I, no one of us knew that, that he, they were perhaps selling information. Did he suspect that I had followed him? Did he no, know? He, he didn't suspect. Marcus said, oh, I'm caught, I'm, I'm, I'm very afraid. There must be a freak on the other side who, 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 who traced me. I can't believe that yeah, because I have, yeah. have, such a lot, have done such a lot of things. <laughs> I'm not a computer freak. But you seem to be one. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. You just don't know. One and thing disturbed Volker more than the involvement of Marcus Hess in espionage. So the mysterious death of his friend Hagbard, Hagbard the hacker who had died. As Hagbard was, was a sad person, so when I learned him to know in 1985, 1986, he was much more friendly and, and he was an open-hearted open person. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, then, then it went down with him, so I think he, he took drugs more and more and then you could see he was sitting at the table in this Tuesday evening group and he only listened and, and his eyes stared far away and, yeah. and he, he wasn't, he was absent. Hagbard died in May 1989, just after being charged with espionage. The authorities said he committed suicide, but the circumstances of his death left his friends wondering. Had he been killed? Perhaps by the KGB? He drove away from Hanover to Celle, a city about 50 kilometers from Hanover, and he had to do a job there in Celle, and he never came back from this job, and I heard in the newspapers a few days later that he was found in a forest near the city, and he was burned. They said that he burned himself with gas. This is where Hagbard died. What really happened, nobody knows. We have this discrepancy of 75 cents. Uh, Cliff, are you sure this is the same guy? So why don't you make up some secret government information? Marcus said, there must be a freak on the other side who, 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 who traced me. I looked over the shoulders of Karl Koch and see him hacking. Say, oh, what's that? And then decided to do also, because it's fascinating. Now I see it's, it's not okay. But in the beginning, I haven't thought about anything. I was just only there, sitting and hacking.
Funding for NOVA is provided by Lockheed, a bold new force in systems engineering, management and technology services for defense, space and industry. And the Johnson & Johnson family of companies, supplying health care products worldwide. Major funding for NOVA is provided by the financial support of viewers like you. For a transcript of this program, send $5 to this address or call 212-227-READ. This is PBS.